Well, good morning. This has been quite an emotional week in the wake of the massacre in Orlando that is unparalleled in our country. I've observed layers of sadness, fear, anger, prayer, and action. You know, we had such a joyous weekend here last weekend. We had our vacation Bible school kids, and everyone was singing and happy. And then we learned the news. Today we are amid the joy of Father's Day, and yet we are reminded of the grief and the shock and the anger and the fear, which for me is reinforced every time I turn the television set on. Maybe you did this too. I watched for a while, and then I said, okay, I have to turn it off. And then after a little while, I thought, well, I should watch again. I should know what's going on. And then I watched, and then I muted it for a while. I thought, well, if I just see anything change, I could could watch. It is so hard to hear the heartbreak from the families the comments from the survivors, the updates from the doctors at the hospitals. But I was really brought up short when the commentator began to talk about 49 funerals. You know, I have the privilege to work with families at a time when we plan funerals. Most of you in your life have been in that position. I know the emotional roller coaster the balance between mourning the loss and celebrating the life. And it is hard when a person has died, even after a good, long life. It is a different kind of hard, trying to achieve the balance between grief and life, when the life is young, when the life is cut short in tragic circumstances. These are beyond tragic circumstances. Now, maybe some of you were hoping that this would not be the topic for the sermon today. Maybe you were hoping that this would be one place where you could get a little respite from that. Well, I'm sorry. Please feel free to let your mind wander to any place that God takes it. But we have to talk about this. The gospel, the letter to the Galatians, the cry in Isaiah, all point to what we are experiencing. I want to start with some words from our bishop. Bishop Eaton reminded us in his statement this week that we cannot shy away from this. In his statement, he wrote, United in grief, bound together in love and compassion, and strengthened in resolve, we stand in solidarity with our sisters and brothers particularly those in the LGBT community who continue to be confronted by violence, prejudice, and bigotry. He went on to say, we also acknowledge the pain and pressure with which our faithful Muslim fellow citizens live and who also condemn this and all acts of violence carried out in the name of their ancient and venerable tradition of Abraham. The bishop continued, we remain firm in our conviction that God's eternal love embraces all people. It is this divine love which cherishes us in loss and pain, sustains us in grief, and will not let us be overwhelmed in the face of evil. These are important words. This is where we stand. But yet we're on that roller coaster, grief and eternal promise. And that eternal promise that sustains us and then is undermined by the grief. A few days ago, Representative Jim Himes of Connecticut's 4th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives walked out of that house during the moment of prayer, the moment of silence for the massacre in Orlando. In a newspaper article, Himes is quoted describing that moment of silence in the house. He said, we did it five times just last year. Stopped talking about sports and dinner for about 10 seconds. Put on our most serious faces. Wondered if we'd turned off our cell phones for 10 seconds. 
done, over, on to the next thing. Not me, he said. Not anymore. All I know, he said, is that the regular moments of silence on the house floor do not honor the victims of violence. They are an affront. In the chamber where change is made, they are a tepid, self-satisfying emblem of impotence and willful negligence. It is action that will stop next week's mass shooting. I will not be silent. Himes District is adjacent to Sandy Hook. Personally, I agree with Heim's action to walk out on that moment of silence. I feel a bit like Jim Himes today. I stood in this very pulpit on the Sunday after Sandy Hook. I have not counted how many times I have stood in this pulpit or we have gathered recognizing the issues of mental health and guns and bigotry and here we are again. But as the church, we have a very different job than Himes and his colleagues in Congress. It is their job to act, and they have not acted. It is the job of Congress to reflect the will of the people and make laws that protect the population. Have they? But we have a different job than Congress. It is our job to hold the moments of silence. It is our job to hold the candlelight vigils. It is our job to offer the funerals that help families balance between grief and the celebration of life. It is our job to pray. We bring our voices of faith today into prayer with millions across the world who say, enough. We add the prayer voice of St. Paul's to the prayers of the world for an end to gun violence and injustice. Our local Episcopal churches, our diocese, our Episcopal church across the country, the Anglican churches across the world have lifted voices this week with words, chants, songs, liturgies, and in action. We join with millions of Christians of all denominations. We join with millions of Muslims and Jews in our condemnation of violence. We pervert our faith traditions when we condone violence. You and I know that the Bible is a violent book, but that does not condone violence today. We cannot attribute violence to God if we look at the life and work and witness of Jesus Christ. And that's who we are. We are followers of Jesus Christ. In Luke's gospel today, Jesus heals a man who is filled with demons, a legion of demons. There are so many. The man is ostracized, chained to keep him from harming others. People are afraid of the man who is possessed by demons. But Jesus heals that man, drives demons out of him into a herd of swine that are drowned in the river. But when the man, fully clothed and in his right mind, is sitting at the feet of Jesus, people are afraid of that too. They are afraid of the power of God, and they drive Jesus out of town. This story certainly evokes issues of stigma in mental health care. This story echoes the call for demons to be run out, the demons of bigotry, hatred, arrogance. We must drive out these demons. We drive out demons with justice, with mercy, and with prayer. In our Episcopal tradition, we have a deep and wide and intense tradition of prayer. And that is what we are called to. In your Book of Common Prayer, page 856, defines prayer for us. Prayer is responding to God by thought and by deeds with 
or without words. As Christians, we pray to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray in many different ways. We pray by adoration, praise, thanksgiving, penitence, oblation, intercession, petition. And you've probably done all of those in the past week. When you are just adoring God, you are looking into the face of someone you love or into an incredible sunrise, and you just know God is present. When you praise God this week, say it out loud. There are so many people who need to hear praise of God. The Book of Common Prayer says, for what do we offer thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is offered to God for all the blessings of this life, for our redemption, and for whatever draws us closer to God. Gratitude. We know that not everything we have comes from our own ability. Penitence. In just a few moments, we will gather as we always do when we are together, and we will say, we're sorry. We had a vacation Bible school lesson about forgiveness. And in the story, there's a younger sister chastising her brother. She says, you know, you always say you're sorry, but you know what? That's not enough for me. You have to change. You have to help me with the chores. You have to do those things that are right. And so penitence involves that intention to amend our lives, to turn and right the wrongs that are done by us and on our behalf. Prayers of oblation we offer every time we are together. We offer ourselves, our souls, and our bodies to God in union with Christ for God's purposes. That's how we act. Intercession and petition have been on everyone's lips this week. Dear Lord, help. Help the people in Orlando. Help their families. Help those who are still ill and hurt by these bullets. Help the first responders and the doctors and nurses. Help us. Help this crazy world we live in. Intercession, petition, where we stand before God, bringing the needs of others, that God's will may be done. We do this together. We are a corporate body. We are people praying out loud together. Paul's letter to the Galatians reminds us that we are all children of God. We are reminded that in baptism, our eyes become like God's eyes. We no longer see Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So this week, I encourage you, double down, add more prayer. Be in in prayer as constantly as you can, knowing that your voice adds to other voices, your actions add to other actions. I was talking about prayer with a member of our congregation this week who said to me, prayer she feels connects her to God. She said, it's like God's language of love for me. She shook her head and she said, how often is God misunderstood? Because we are a few generations removed from prayer being our first language. So pray. Find your energy this week. Find your prayer this week. What will your prayer be? Amen.